Well, good morning, and welcome to all of you. Thanks for braving uh, many of you uh, South New Holland Road or over here or whatever road that is and uh, making it here safely. We're thankful that you are here and uh, good to be worshiping with you on this here Lord's Day. And in honor of the NFL Conference Championship Games today, uh, I share with you a quote that I know I've shared before, but I'll share it again. Uh, and it's from Tom Brady during his 60 Minutes interview uh, when he was asked about what is next. Now that he's won three rings at the time, he's since gone on to win four more, but at the time, after three rings, which was a big deal, what, what, was, what is next, the interviewer asked him. And he said this, quote, Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey man, this is what is. I, I've reached my goal, my dream, my life. Me, I think, there's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't it. This can't be what it's all cracked up to, to be. When the interviewer asked, what's the answer? Brady could only say, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. Like I said, he's since gone on to win four more rings, but I imagine his answer would still be something similar to that. An itching, a searching, a longing for something more, even now that he's won seven Super Bowl rings. As human beings, it seems we are never satisfied. We always want more. We what we have is, is never enough. We want more money, more power, more pleasure, another round. Just like Brazy, Brady, we ask ourselves, is this all there is or is there something greater? Is there something more? And if there is, then what is it? In the 1960s, uh, Malcolm Muggeridge was a very popular British journalist. Uh, he came to faith late in life. And in his book, Jesus Rediscovered, he writes about his experience of having everything, yet it adding up to nothing. Here is what he says. I may, I suppose, regard myself or pass for being as a relatively successful man. I feel like I should almost be reading this in a British accent, but I won't. People occasionally stare at me in the streets. That's fame. I can fairly easily earn enough to qualify for admission to the higher slopes of the internal revenue. That's success. Furnished with money and a little fame, even the elderly, if they care to, may partake of trendy diversions. That's pleasure. It might happen once in a while that something I said or wrote was sufficiently heated for me to persuade myself that it represented a serious impact on our time. That's fulfillment. Yet I say to you, and I beg you to believe me, multiply these tiny triumphs by a million and add them all together, and they are nothing. Less than nothing, a positive impediment measured against one draft of the living water Christ offers to the spiritually thirsty, irrespective of who or what they are. So even someone who checks all of the boxes of success and fame and fortune comes to the conclusion of life with those words. And these lessons of Tom Brady and, and Malcolm Muggeridge are, are precisely the lessons that we learn in Ecclesiastes 2 this morning. And so if you have your Bibles or your booklets or what have you, you can turn there to Ecclesiastes 2 with me, and we'll see this here in the first 11 verses. We have a huge problem with pleasure. It might feel good and satisfy for a time, but it's temporary and cannot satisfy our deepest longings of our hearts. One author puts it that hedonism, this pursuit of pleasure, is a hollow house. Not much inside. There are many rooms, but this house of pleasure is nothing but a sandcastle by a seashore. It will soon 
fall and be washed away. But let's take some time and, and look at this, this hedonist house that Solomon built, his life of, of pursuing pleasure, and see what he has found. So Ecclesiastes 2, beginning in verse 1. I said in my heart, Come now, I, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this was also vanity. I said of laughter, It is mad and of pleasure. What use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold of folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than anyone who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep them from it. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Words we've heard before. For much of his life, Solomon did not hold back in pursuing his pleasures. If we were to read through his life in 1 Kings, we would see that in the, in the world's eyes, he was a man that had everything. He had money, he had power, he had influence, and endless, endless pleasures to satisfy whatever it was he wanted. And in verses 1 and 2 of our text, we, we see that he tested his heart with all the pleasures the world could provide. He kept nothing from himself. And the following verses then seem to read as another sort of autobiography of all that he did trying to fulfill himself. He accumulated and accumulated, built and bought. For Solomon, it was all about me, myself, and I as evidence of all the eyes used in our text. Nearly 20 eyes, if we were to count them, are used in these 11 verses. But in spite of all his pleasurable endeavors and his accumulation of all of these pleasurable things, he calls it mad and asks of what good or use is all of it in verse 2. Laughter can only numb us for so long and, and pleasure never deeply satisfies the longing of our hearts. We, of course, try and, and numb our pain in several ways, but the numbing ultimately doesn't satisfy. In fact, nothing on this side of heaven will satisfy us how we truly please. And this is nothing new to the human race. This is nothing new to our human condition. Since the garden, we've been chasing after these cheap pleasures. Like Eve in, in Genesis 3, verse 6, we look for whatever delights our eyes, thinking it will delight our hearts as well. We scavenge for happy things and things that will make us wise. But this is ultimately a fruitless endeavor, for none of it satisfies how we wish it would because we're searching in the wrong place. We can't find true satisfaction under the sun something hopefully we continue to hear repeated throughout Ecclesiastes. We as human beings cannot find satisfaction that we so desire on
on this side of heaven under the sun. So as we look at what Solomon writes to us here in his uh, hedonist, self-indulgent, hollow house, first thing he does is, is Solomon takes us down to his bar, a place where he tries to enjoy the, the pleasures of laughter, of alcohol, and music. In verse 2, he was determined trying to numb the, plain, the pain with, with, with pleasure, but he calls it mad. It's, it's amazing how many comedians are some of the most depressed people, only to be learned later in life. And in verse 3, he searched with his heart how to cheer himself with wine. And then down in verse 8, we see he, he, bought, he brought in male and female singers. He obviously did not have a radio, but he had no shortage of exotic music. And I say exotic because typically in the temple it was just male singers. But here Solomon has both male and female singers. Probably four-part harmony, if not more. And also exotic because it's not just from the region that they were in, but because of his influence globally, these very well could have been singers from all over the world. So this rarity of music was not so rare for Solomon. This pleasure of his ears was not rare to him at all. It, all of this belonged to him, but music did not satisfy his soul. And along with his music came strong drink. And with his heart guiding him with wisdom, that is, with a certain amount of mindful self-control or objective indulgence, he tests wine to see whether it will cheer him enough to forget the few days of his earthly existence in order to find some happiness in his own created happy hour. But it's only temporary. Later, according to Solomon, wine can give us a merry heart, Ecclesiastes 9. It gladdens life, Ecclesiastes 10. There's nothing wrong with it in and of itself, but it's a poor lover. It's a mocker, it's a brawler that leads us astray, which he writes in Proverbs 20. It cannot truly satisfy our deepest of longings. And this is important for us to consider because much of the world around us lives for, for all of these things we're about to mention. Much of the world around us lives for a good, strong drink at the end of the day. So many live for the bottle, for the weekend, the next great party with the open bar. But at the same time, go to the AA meeting, Alcoholics Anonymous, go to the AA meeting and ask them what they think of all of it. Ask the college student hugging a toilet at 3 a.m., the family of a father who nightly rages after a few beers, or the alcoholic who lost his job. And they will tell you, it cannot give you what we're what you're truly searching, what you're truly longing for. Alcohol cannot satisfy the longings of our heart. And in Solomon's bar, with the wine comes laughter, seen again in verse 2. Like the fool who laughs while he plays with deadly fire from Proverbs 26, Solomon's bar is alive with deadly laughter that tries to numb our existence. Another song is sung, another round is served, another joke is told. But when everyone goes home, the bar clears out, the same problems still persist. Not even laughter can satisfy us. Now again, I'll note, these things are not all e they're not evil within themselves, they're not bad things within themselves, but if we're looking for them to satisfy our deepest longings, they can never do such a thing. So inside the hedonist house, we move on. We walk through the, the cedar French doors out into the beautiful garden that would put Longwood to shame as we 
take in all of its beauty. A garden that rivals Eden itself. Consider again Solomon's amazing architectural and agricultural accomplishments. He says, I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than anyone who had before me in Jerusalem. Again, in one sense, Solomon has recreated the Garden of Eden for himself, but nothing in his garden was off limits. Whatever is pleasing to the eye is yours. And Solomon was doing all that Adam did as well. He planted, he watered, he made. The similarity between this and Genesis 2 is striking. But as we read this, all of it seems to just kind of bounce off the walls in Solomon's mind in his chamber of pride. It does not read the same, even though the language is so similar. We do not get the same sense of all when we read Ecclesiastes 2 as we do when we read Genesis 2. Instead, we are left with, with learning about this, with this man who is so proud and boastful that these eyes just keep, as we read these eyes, they just keep painting us because of his hedonism. I made great works, I built houses, I planted vineyards, I made myself gardens and parks, I planted fruit trees, I made myself pool. Where is the Lord? And he bought slaves, both male and female, to work all of it. He exuded power and dominance in every facet of life. And to mention his slavery, though this kind of slavery differs in kind from the slavery in our American history, the principle of it remains inhumanely the same. One person is owned by another person like property. Sadly, throughout history, humans show this desire to own others, to boss them, and to have the power to dictate to others the service we want for ourselves, and Solomon was no different here exuding that that want, that desire, that power of dominance. And and by analogy, uh, uh, bad employers can act like slave masters. Employers can demand more and more from their employees and essentially threaten their livelihood and personal life because they know their employee needs the job. So the boss might treat them as dirt, as less than human, less than the image of God they were created in. Or much more simply, if we consider this in a restaurant setting, how do we treat our waiter or our waitresses serving our table? Are we kind and gracious, or do we like the dominance that our position holds, that knowing our tip at the end of the bill holds? So are we demanding and quick-tempered? Do we see them as real human beings created in the image of God, or are they something less to us? Solomon's point in all of this remains the same. Power cannot satisfy. Influence does not satisfy. Solomon calls it vanity. It doesn't satisfy the deepest desires of our heart. From his beautiful garden, we we make our way down the long corridor to his office. And as we walk this this long hallway, we pass cover after cover of Solomon's face on Forbes magazine. For year after year, he is declared the richest man in the whole world. And when we get inside his office, we we realize that this is no ordinary office. It, It more so resembles a big bank, or probably more similar to to Fort Knox, where we store our gold. Because gold bars line every wall of Solomon's office, and the riches of the world hang from these golden walls. Uh, If you want a fun exercise after this, 
go and read 1 Kings 10, 1 Kings 10, and it, it lists all of Solomon's riches. It's incredible. There's no shortage of the treasures of Solomon's house. Needless to say, money was no issue for him. Whatever he wanted, he could afford. The chateau in France, the massive yacht parked out in Monaco, the beach house in the Bahamas, the penthouse in New York City, it was all his. Anything he could imagine. He was the primary shareholder of Amazon, of Apple, of Tesla. He had all of the world's riches. And everything he touched, like King Midas, turns to gold. And another fun exercise, maybe, if you, if you Google uh, the net worth of Solomon, uh, Google returned that he was uh, $2.1 trillion was Solomon's net worth. Richest man in history. $2.1 trillion. To try to give us some perspective, because we don't have any perspective of how much $2.1 trillion is. He's richer than Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, the, the founder of Amazon, Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook, Bill Gates, and Warren Buffett combined. And it's not even that close with those guys. If you double all of their net worths, Solomon is still $500 billion richer. That's how rich and wealthy Solomon was. Money was of zero issue to Solomon. But what does he say of his $2.1 trillion net worth? What does he say of all? He says, it's vanity and striving after wind. That this gain is in fact no gain at all. All his money, all his gold cannot touch him. It cannot embrace him. It is cold. Treasure might make us smile, but our treasures cannot keep the frowns of the world away. Money cannot satisfy the deep longings of our heart. Solomon wants us to see this too. And then we uncomfortably move on from Solomon's treasury into his bedroom. He wonders if if pleasures of the human body might be the answer to true human satisfaction. 1 Kings 10 is about Solomon's treasure. Well, if you go on one more chapter, 1 Kings 11, it's all about his lust of women. In it, it reads, King Solomon loved many foreign women. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And in our text... It says he gathered these for his delight. He hides none of this from us. It's all out there for us to see and learn from. For Solomon writes, none of this satisfies. Solomon's continual compromise of what marriage was, was meant to be, found in Genesis 2, left him broken and unsatisfied, as well as a wake of women and children along the way who could, would be experiencing similar emotions of unfulfillment and brokenness. And ultimately, the compromise of, of the covenant is what led to Solomon's spiritual downfall and is what divided the kingdom. And this is probably why it's listed last here to give it as a point of emphasis that this indeed was a major part of his downfall. And for Solomon, in rejecting the biblical standard of one woman plus one, one man plus one woman for life, Solomon was, was anti-Genesis and anti-Jesus. And what he found is, is, of all of it, again, sex cannot satisfy. Now, once again, our culture equally pursues this pleasure, if not more so than other pleasures. Just about everywhere you turn, we are confronted by it. It's even made its way into our politics. And it's definitely opposed to what we would call our biblical view of sexuality. I'll say, say this, the, the average person has over seven sexual partners in their lifetime. The average person. 
That's the reality of the world we step into. There are apps, there are styles, there are services, there are all sorts of things where the main goal is to find you a partner for the end of your evening. But, but not a significant part, partner, just someone to sp spend the night with. Again, service is dedicated to that. But Sol Solomon says, this cannot satisfy. Sex cannot satisfy. So don't sacrifice your soul on the altar of, of sexual idolatry. And definitely don't build your life around it. He says the desire for this pleasure is vanity. It's meaningless. It's like striving after the wind. It will leave you hurt and broken and unfulfilled, hoping and searching for more. In other words, Solomon's saying, your sexual identity is not the most important thing about you. And if you don't think that this is a serious issue in our world today, just know that some of the things that I've already said uh, about sexuality would be illegal to say right now in Canada as they've passed a new law. To tell the story of Genesis 2 and to claim it as the idea sexual relationship that God has intended for us could be considered what, Canadian, what, what the Canadian government now calls conversion therapy, which under their new law again is illegal. So it is a very much a pressing issue, again, not just in the world we see at ground level, but also in the political world. Now, there's a whole other conversation that we could have about uh, our expectations of government and the ethics of it all in the world as it plays out. But no, Solomon, what Solomon is saying remains the same, that our, our sexual identity is not the most important thing about you. Sex cannot satisfy. They will ultimately leave us, leave you, feeling empty. Solomon summarizes all of his disillusionment that he's been through in the, this summary statement found in verses 9 to 11. He says, So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and striving after wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. A man who had it all. Anything that we could ever desire or want or hope to have. And Solomon sees it as nothing. The wine and women, the gardens and gold, songs and servants. He had everything one could ever imagine, but it wasn't enough. So he amassed a great empire of dirt. But why? What, what went wrong with the pleasure and possessions experiment for him to call it profitless? Well, I think there are two explanations of the failure. Putting self first, ironically, fails to satisfy self, and also, ironically, fails to give pleasure. The first failure deals with the sin of selfishness, and the second with idolatry. The first failure breaks the second greatest commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. While the second failure breaks the greatest commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. Notice the sin of selfishness. As we've already mentioned, Solomon's favorite word here in our text seems to be I. What he has done is the dominant refrain. All of his endeavors were self-serving and inward-focused. He wasn't philanthropic or generous. 
And as Solomon boasts in his achievements and enjoyments, he highlights their ultimate inadequacy. It's not enough. This is the paradox of pleasure. We heard it in Tom Brady's words. There's got to be more. And for Solomon, self, we see that self-centeredness and self-indulgence never satisfies us for long. God designed us for more than ourselves. Our chief end is not to glorify ourselves and enjoy ourselves forever. No, we are made for more. We are made for the Lord. Pleasure has a way of promising more than it can give. And David Hubbard explains this, this about pleasure in a very profound quote. He says, Advertising agency is better than its manufacturing department. The one drink, one sexual fling, one contest won, one project accomplished, one wild party, none of these, nor all of them put together, can be enough to bring satisfaction. And again, that's why the advertising agency is better than its manufacturing department. It can't follow through on its promises. The sin of selfishness won't satisfy, and neither will the sin of idolatry. Putting pleasure first fails, ironically, to give pleasure. Solomon has lived the dream of, of many people within these 11 verses. But as it turns out, it's not enough. For nothing on this side of heaven will satisfy. Nothing will be enough if God isn't first. This is the reality that Solomon wants us to learn and know. John Wesley, in January 2nd, 1777, writes this in his journal. I began expounding in order the book of Ecclesiastes. I never before had so clear a sight either of the meaning or the beauties of it. Neither did I imagine that the several parts of it were in so exquisite a manner connected together, all tending to prove that grand truth, that there is no happiness outside of God. That's from John Wesley's journal, writing about Ecclesiastes. There is no happiness outside of God, no true, lasting fulfillment, satisfaction, pleasure outside of God. In other words, Satan's a better marketer than he is manufacturer, as he sells us these cheapened and unfulfilling pleasures. Many of the pleasures mentioned by Solomon such as laughing, planting vineyards, drinking wine, creating and maintaining a garden, all are commendable biblical pleasures. Again, these are all, are, are all good things in the proper context. In fact, in the wisdom literature of the Bible, pleasures and possessions are, are God's uh, reward for righteousness, for righteous living. So what is the problem with it here? Well, simply, some of these pleasures are immoral, but all of them, even the non-immoral ones, all of them became idols. All of them were idols. Solomon put pleasure before the worship of the Lord his God. He broke the very first commandment about not having any other gods before his Lord. We need to worship God by receiving every pure pleasure then as a gift from him. We are to never put the gift before the giver. This is all Solomon's point. And in this way, our pleasure becomes God-centered as we recognize all of these good gifts are from him. This is the, the nuanced difference in how we receive these pleasures. Don't mistake the gift for the giver. So the lesson here is that God comes first. And then, with divine worship, First, genuine human satisfaction follows. For Christ alone is our satisfaction. In him is where true and lasting reward lies. Where true and lasting pleasure rests. In the book of Philippians, Paul commands Christians to rejoice in the Lord. Why? We can rejoice because Jesus, in humility, counted others more significant than himself, 
So much so that he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Our King Jesus is the epitome of selflessness, of putting God and others first. For our sake and our salvation, he denied the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride and possessions. That's 1 John 2. When Jesus was tempted by Satan and later then by Peter to take the crown before or instead of the cross, he would not bow the knee to the idol of temporary pleasure or worldly power. Rather, it was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross. Hebrews 12. You see, our Lord, who who taught us to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily, did not do so because he was trying to be a cosmic killjoy, but rather because he knows the way of the pleasures of the Father are the ones that in his presence will last forevermore. These things from Ecclesiastes 2 will not and cannot satisfy you. Apart from God, only Jesus can bring us the true satisfaction that we so desire, the true longing, the true pleasure that will last, not temporarily, but forever. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What would Solomon say? It's nothing. It's nothing profits this man. It's, it's vanity. The hedonist house is hollow and pleasureless. But what does it profit a man to lose his life for Jesus' sake and the sake of the kingdom? Everything. Profits the man everything. It's amazing to, you know, you can pick up the martyr's mirror, which has a rich history in our setting. And it's a rich thing to read about the saints of our own history who who gave everything that they had, their own very lives for the sake and the cause of Christ. What does it profit those men and women? It profits them everything. The temporary pleasures on this side of heaven will not last. They cannot last. They cannot satisfy. Only Jesus can truly satisfy the longings, the desire of our hearts. Only he can give us the pleasure we so long for. So why fool around with these temporary fleeting pleasures that exist under the sun when there is an infinite joy offered to you in Christ? Why, to use C.S. Lewis's analogy in his his famous book, uh, The Weight of Glory, why do we act like children making mud pies in a slum when we are offered an oceanside vacation? Why are we far too easily pleased? And in the words of of Douglas O'Donnell writing about this text, let us flee then from the hollow house of hedonism into the hallowed presence of our Lord. For this is where ultimate pleasure, ultimate joy, abundant life exists. All we could ever hope for or desire exists in the promises and fellowship of God our Savior. The pleasures of earth are temporary and unsatisfying, but the joy of our salvation in Christ lasts forever. This is the hope of glory. This is the hope we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Edens we try to create will never satisfy our longings. They will never be as pleasurable as we hope. And only Jesus can fulfill these true things. He is the cup we drink from. from. He is the food we partake. He is the one in whom we live forever. Let's pray to close. God, we thank you for this morning, this Lord's Day, in which we gather together uh, to honor and glorify you in all things, in our music, in our conversations, in our laughing together, in the word that you have given to us in Ecclesiastes, and and we thank you that our pursuit in these things is not meaningless, it's not vanity, 
And it's not vanity because we do not separate them from who you are. And we recognize that the pleasures you give us on this side of heaven are good gifts from you, meant to be enjoyed. But they're not meant to be enjoyed apart from you. So God, I pray that uh, where we may fall short of, of this thinking, of these ideals, I pray that we would be quick to see these things, quick to repentance, uh, as we recognize you as the giver of all these good gifts. And God, I pray that we wouldn't live lives of, of selfishness, that we wouldn't live lives of, of idolatry, uh, but instead, as your first, as your greatest commandments tell us, I pray that we would truly desire to and truly strive to live for you and all that we do. And I pray that before ourselves, we would put the neighbors around us. We would care for them. We would love them. We would be hospitable towards them as we uh, hold on to our things with open hands. Instead of one mile, we go two. Instead of, of just our cloak, we give our shirt as well. God, I pray that uh, what would be characteristic of, of us as Hershey's would be a, a radical hospitality that cares and loves the people that you have uh, put in our lives. So God, I pray that you would continue to conform us, to mold us, to shape us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, so that all of these things would remain true. We love you. pray this in your Son's name. Amen.